to install was just sitting up there. So. Yeah, I had picked it up and then left it there. <laughs> All right. The air feels <clears throat> dry. Like, my nose is, like, dried out. Well, good evening, everybody. Winter's back. We'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and we will sing, sing, sing Joy to the world We will sing, sing, sing Come on. Joy to the world the Savior let men their songs employ wow. fields and floods rocks, hills and plains repeat the sound repeat in joy the sound in joy repeat the sound in joy This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how I fight my battles.
this is I This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how we will sing, sing, sing oh, We sing to the Lord Sing, this is how I fight This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I will sing, sing, sing.
Father, we bless you tonight. Lord, let's magnify the Lord in our hearts now before we continue on in worship. Let's just take a moment. <coughs> Glorify the Lord in your heart tonight. We ask for your forgiveness of our sin. We ask for the release of any shame that we may be carrying or guilt from our sin and that we know that there's no condemnation as we walk in you. That's the wrong song. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's the wrong song. I don't know why I have a holy night last. It, what, you switched it? Yeah, that's what I got on mine. <laughs> Which one do you guys want? All right, we're going to try this again. Revelation song.
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Yeah. Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. song is Oh Holy Night. <laughs> it wasn't in that order. Not in the order we practiced. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth.
we do thank you because of one night when the world changed forever. Lord, and as we're in the season where we consider the ramifications of what it meant for an eternal God to step into time, into space, into humanity, into the mess and muck that is us, and Lord, what ripples that sent through the entire spiritual realm. Lord, what a sacrifice, what love. Lord, and when we look at the things that you did in this world, the purpose that you came for, a purpose was there even then as you were born as a child. And Lord, you were obedient every step of the way to it. And I pray that we would follow your example. I pray that in the patience that you had and waiting for the moments that were preordained by your father, Lord, that we would be obedient to trust the timing, yes. to trust the process, mm -hmm. to trust the steps that you have in front of us and not get so far ahead of where you have us right now. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that you would make us faithful like you were faithful in the season where we're in. And Lord, I pray that we would be glorifying Jesus in everything that we do. Lord, that our lives would be fragrant aromas to you. And Lord, to the world, that we would stick out like a sore thumb. Lord, we love you, and I pray that you would just capture us with your love. Mm -hmm. Lord, you are an amazing, a dynamic, a beautiful, an amazing God. And I just pray that we would continue throughout this season we, where our hearts are so caught by beauty that we would remember your beauty. Mm -hmm. Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. I think she does it better than me. What do you think? <laughs> no. All right. Open your Bibles. That's all you get. So for the next um, couple of weeks, we're, gonna, we're going to kick off Genesis probably uh, once we get to the new year. But as we're preparing to kick off Genesis, I have been praying about taking some time to try to delineate um, where I'm at and all the ruckus that went down with Buell Bible Church. Occasionally, people still ask. So I'm going to try to walk through uh, what shifted. I'll give a bit of an introduction this week. We'll get more in depth next week, <clears throat> trying to nail it down. But um, as I shared before, I am, I was once dispensational and I am not dispensational anymore. Now, usually what happens when somebody says that is everybody else calls you a replacement theology guy. So <clears throat> the reason they do that is because in the world of systematic theology, if there are I could probably come up with six uh, systematic theology um, schools, covenant theology, progressive covenantalism, new covenant theology, progressive dispensationalism, and dispensationalism. There's five. And of all of those, uh, only dispensationalism has uh, the view that they have, and all the rest of them they call replacement theology because they differ in the sense of the distinction between the church and Israel. So dispensationalists keep a sharp distinction between the church and Israel. There are two separate entities and um, everybody else that's not dispensational 
has them in one way or another unified together in Christ. Um, so I had done a study through Romans where I think I first started to kind of, I saw that more clearly. And so uh, it caused me to question a lot of things and, and that led to a little bit of drama and a lot of issues. So what I'm going to try to do in the next couple of weeks is just try to outline where I'm at. It doesn't require you to be where I am. You're welcome to think about systematic theology however you want. I'm not a great system guy anyway, so it's not going to bother me. But I want you to know where I am so that when your friends tell you Jackie's a heretic, you can either agree with them because you know the truth. <laughs> you can either agree with them because you know the truth or at least hopefully be able to understand where I'm coming from. So we're going to take a look at something that is called progressive covenantalism. That's the systematic that I am uh, that, that I am in, that's the, that's the camp I have <clears throat> in the last year. Initially, I couldn't define myself because I'm, I didn't know what there was out there, who thought what. And I'm a book guy, so I like to go read the guys who have gone before me, where they've, what they've seen, what they've worked their way through. And so that was a lot of books. And I'm still not done, but... Uh, at least this part, I have, I have settled in my mind. And so I just want to kind of explain that stuff out. So if you guys are good with it, I'm going to try to explain it all out. Probably not so much this week, but next week when we get a little bit deeper into things, if you've got questions, we'll have opportunity to ask and kind of go back and forth on it. It's nice because this time when I try to do this, It'll be just people from my church that are here, so that's cool. <clears throat> Instead, I won't have any extra visitors, as far as I know, of course. Next week, who knows what could happen. So, so let me give you some definitions of what I think. Pro, uh, progressive covenantalism, big, fancy theological term, but the idea is this. There's one cohesive story in the biblical record. From Genesis to Revelation, one story, God's redemption of man. So that's the kind of the anchor. And why, why have I leaned this way? Uh, three things. Uh, I think it shows how the whole Bible tells one unified story. I think it shows that well. I think it shows how the whole Bible points to Jesus. And I will say definitively, Jesus is the central point of everything. Uh, and, and when I say that, for me, at least in my past, I think there was a sense in which some people would put Israel there. I'm not saying everybody, but for some people, Israel's the centerpiece of it all. For me, the centerpiece of it all is Jesus Christ and what he's done and how that then relates to Israel and the nations. And then the third thing is um, um, it, it provided a framework for understanding the Old Testament prophecies about Israel. So those are kind of the three things we'll walk our way through, taking a look at it. <laughs> One of the things about progressive covenantalism is the idea that each covenant from the beginning, creation, all the way to the new covenant, is progressive revelation of God revealing himself through the nation of Israel to the world. Well, before there's a nation of Israel in creation, you guys kind of there's, there's a little bit of a gap there, right? Noah's not Israel and, and Adam's not Israel, but Adam, or Abraham is the beginning. Okay, you guys kind of with me? So God's revealing himself to the world through the covenant. So the covenants are the Edenic, that's like um, the rules of Eden. You have the Adamic, which is the covenant with Adam. Well, you see more of that brought out in the book of Romans and the book of Galatians. Uh, the Noahic, the flood of Noah, the Abrahamic. You have a lot of people consider the Palestinian covenant a covenant, but just so I, I just want to make it, you understand what the Palestinian, the Palestinian covenant is a covenant about the land. It's a repeating what God already said to Abraham, right? The gift of the land. 
So in my sense, in my in my mind, it's a little redundant, but I didn't want to I didn't want to skip it. Mosaic covenant, that's the law, right? Davidic covenant, that's the promise of a king, and then the new covenant. So in progressive covenantalism, um, it argues that the Bible presents through these covenants. Uh, progressively reveals God's redemptive plan for his people. And it reaches its fulfillment in Christ. So I'm going to point to Christ often and say he's the, he's the end of all the promises. All the promises in some way find their fulfillment in Christ. So uh, and that, uh, that terminus of that covenant, um, that's the new covenant, the establishment of the new covenant. So I want to kind of walk you through how I, how I kind of think of the story, the beginning of the story. We'll maybe get to Abraham tonight. We probably won't get past him very far, but there's a lot of stuff to discuss in there that we'll be able to take a look at. So the point of the Adamic and the Edenic uh, covenant to me ultimately is the fall of man. There's some other stuff in there about man ruling over creation. Man has a responsibility for that. But, but I just want to focus on the fall, the idea that in Adam, uh, Adam fell, so mankind is fallen before God. So sin enters in. In fact, Romans 5 kind of builds on this idea. If you've been in Romans lately, Romans 5, we'll just look at 12 to 14. If you guys want to turn there, you can, or I think they got them up on the screen. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. So the idea through Adam, we're sinners separated from God. So I think we're all good there. And then the concept, the second Adam is Christ, right? So for sin indeed was in the world, even before there was a law. Was there a law when Adam fell? There's no, well, there was a law, don't eat the tr fruit of the tree, right? But you know what I mean, the, the, the uh, presentation of the Mosaic law hadn't come yet. So he, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. So you have the picture. You can read the rest of chapter five, but you, you're, he's gonna, Paul's gonna make the distinction that Adam is the picture, the federal headship of Adam in the fall of mankind, and Christ in his federal headship is the picture of redeemed man. Fallen man, Christ is redeemed man. So you can kind of see, I just wanna kind of try to be able to point out the, the concept of, some of the fulfillment in Christ of the covenants as we work our way through. So we look at the beginning of the book of Genesis, which we'll be in in a few weeks. Uh, God created the heavens and the earth, right? So we, everybody settled on that part, I hope. <laughs> we, we have to start over in other ways. <clears throat> so God created the heavens and the earth, and Genesis tells us that man rebelled from God and is separated from God by sin. And so the story of God redeeming man to himself begins in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Right? Everybody familiar? In theology, they call it the Proto-Evangelicum, which just means first mention of the gospel. In uh, Genesis, you can see it, Genesis 3, uh, 14 to 17. Uh, and the judgment that God gives at the fall. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. And he will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So the idea, right, that that the, the first mention of a child, an offspring of a woman, which usually comes from a man, but there's going to be a, 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 someone born of a woman, 
which we all know we're celebrating his birth during Christmas, right? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And so, and what did he do? He destroys the power of Satan, right? He deals the death blow to Satan and Satan is going to bruise his heel. So you have the idea, the reference coming through of what's going on in the creation and the fall of man and God's plan right out the gate to, to redeem mankind. So that's where we're going. That's, that's how it starts. And this is where we're going. Genesis chapter 7, you have the flood. Well, Genesis chapter 6, you have the rebellion, the, the, the sons of God, uh, who took the daughters of men. You have Cain killing Abel. You have a series of rebellion and corruption upon the earth. God saw that that corruption was bad. The intents of men's hearts was only evil continually. And he decided to uh, bring the flood, right? And what we look at, or at least what I'm pulling from Genesis 7, God judges sin and he wipes it out, right? He, he's going to deliver Noah and his family <clears throat> through the flood, but every other person is, is going to perish. And the point being, the end result of sin without, without God's redemption, without God's transformation, is death. And when you look at the flood, one of the things we want to recognize in the flood, the flood didn't solve the sin problem, right? He delivered Noah and his family, but what happens after Noah and them get off the ark? That's right, it was. That's right, it was. So, so we still have the concept, right, of God dealing with uh, sin, God dealing with the uh, redemption of man. You still have the picture of fallen man. And that's going to bring us to Genesis 11. In Genesis 11, you have <coughs> all the world united in one purpose in rebellion against God. You remember the Nimrod in the Tower of Babel? They're building a ziggurat or a tower or a, you know, doesn't matter to me what it is. They're building something up into the heavens, right, to... to make their throne like the most high. It's the same kind of rebellion that we saw from, from Satan. And all man is united in that effort. And God disunifies all mankind. How does he do it? He confuses their languages, right? And now all of a sudden, the guy standing next to you that you're, you were talking to as you were passing the bricks or cutting the stones can't understand what you're saying and you can't understand what he's saying. And it stops that rebellion and people divide and go to with the people they can understand and you have the table of nations or the beginning, uh, the birth of, of all the nations. Now keep in mind, all those nations are in rebellion against God and God still has a plan to redeem man, right? So in Genesis 11... They are all scattered. In Genesis 12, something very important happens, right? He calls Abraham. So now you begin with the birth of the redemptive. The redemptive plan starts back here, but you're starting to see the pieces come together, right? How is he going to accomplish this? He's going to call Abraham to bless the nations and ultimately through him, through him and his family, bring the answer to the sin problem. So it's the beginning, uh, the Abrahamic covenant is the beginning of turning toward uh, God's redemptive solution for the sin problem on earth. How does Israel begin? Well, as a family, they, the Lord said to Abraham, I just want you to know, you know, eventually Abraham has a son, right? The son of promise when he's 100 years old. And then the Lord says, now I'm going to, I'm going to do all these things for you that we're going to talk about in a minute. But before all that happens, just know your family's going to be slaves for 400, give or take years. Right. And so they're going to go into slavery. And what does that slavery 
describe? What, what does that slavery uh, illustrate? Well, all of mankind is enslaved to sin. No. And who delivers mankind from their sin? Ultimately, Jesus is going to. So God is the deliverer of the nation of Israel, right? As they find themselves in bondage. Now, it's not the last time they're going to be in bondage, right? We're going to repeat the cycle a few times, but the point is they're in, they're, they begin as slaves in Egypt in bondage to the world and God is going to redeem them. And I think that prefigures or pictures the restoration and transformation of Israel that is accomplished in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is going to accomplish God's transformative work, uh, begin God's transformative work for the nation of Israel. Uh, obviously, that's still going on, right? It's still going on for us as well. So that restoration takes place under Christ. <clears throat> so Israel was brought into being, called into being out of all the other nations. So we're all the way through chapter 12, 15, um, before we even have a mention of a concept of Israel. All right, Israel is, a, is the tool that God uses that he's going to reveal himself to. He revealed himself, obviously, to Adam, right? He revealed himself, obviously, to Noah, right? He revealed himself, obviously, to Abraham, yeah? He revealed himself, obviously, to, to Moses, right, in the Exodus. And, and so, and then from there, this is, the plan is going to be going through this family. This is how you and I even know anything about God at all. Because God revealed himself to the nation of Israel through the covenants that God brought to Jesus, right? Yeah, coming all the way uh, into, through to us. <clears throat> so Israel's brought in uh, ultimately to deal with the Adamic problem, separation from God. And so we look at, we'll look at the promises to Abraham. The promises to Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant have three parts, the people, the land, and the blessing. So if we look at uh, Genesis 12, 2, uh, the, first, uh, the first time the Lord's talking to him, he says, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. In Genesis 13, 16, he repeats it. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring will be able to be counted. Genesis 15, 5, and he said to him, he brought him outside and he said, look toward the heavens, number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Genesis 17, 6 and 7, he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, plural. Now, we know that to be true when we read Galatians chapter 3, right? We'll see it in just a minute. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, your offspring after you, throughout their generations an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. So you have the promise of the people. Abraham, who, who uh, struggled so long to even have a child, right? And then through Isaac, he's going to see himself become the father of many nations. You remember the song, Father Abraham, we used to sing? Father Abraham had how many sons? Many sons. What's the next part? And I am one of them, and so are you. That's right. You guys get the idea. So you guys get the idea. Now, in 1 Kings 4.20, Scripture says, Judah and Israel, so that's kind of the, the, 
speaking of it in terms of the split kingdom, but it's the totality of Israel, Judah and Israel, were as many as the sand of the sea. What did God promise them? I'm going to make your offspring how? As numerous as the sand of the sea. And what's the declaration we have in 1 Kings 4.20? Not only, this is like the peak of their, of their kingdom, right? Not only were they numbered as the sand of the sea, but it also says they ate and drank and were happy. So it was good, right? Life was, life was good. Now, one of the principles that, that I follow is the idea, and you guys have probably heard this said, we want to let Scripture interpret Scripture. So when the New Testament takes these Old Testament promises and applies them or adds to them or describes them more fully, then I take that as authoritative, right? They're describing what's going on. And so we see it in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, the whole chapter of Galatians chapter 3, guys, but we, we don't have time tonight to look at it all. But looking at verse 7, uh, 7 through 9, Know then, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So who are the sons of Abraham? Those who believe, right? It is those who have faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, don't miss this, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. When it said, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So Paul is looking back at the promises in, that we're looking at in Genesis. And he's saying, hey, the Lord was, was giving Abraham a picture of the gospel, right? Saying, through you, the world is going to be blessed. And we know how that occurs, right? The world is blessed because through Abraham comes who? Jesus. That's right. Through Abraham comes Christ. And I would also say, Revelation 5, 9, there's other places, but I, I, I don't want to inundate us with just a bunch of random scripture, but I want to kind of lay out the idea. And they sang a new song, Revelation 5, 9, singing, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood, what did he do? You ransomed a people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So that's speaking of Jesus, right? We're in the throne room of heaven. Jesus is taking the scroll in Revelation, and they're singing, you're the one who redeemed. So the promise given through Abraham finding its fulfillment and ultimate redemption in Christ. He, he to me, is that answer. The second part, um, hopefully we'll get to all three. This one's longer. The second part of the promise is the land promise. So the land promise, Genesis 13, 14, and 15, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes. Look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, all the land that you see, what's he say? I will give it to you and your offspring forever. This, all, this is all yours. Genesis 15, 18 to 21. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Girgashites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, I want to throw termites in there, but I messed it up. Canaanites, Girgashites, Jebusites. Uh, Genesis 17, 8, he says, And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So you have the promise of the land through Abraham to his offspring. In 1 Kings 4, 21, under the time of Solomon, it says Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates, the land of the Philistines, the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Under the reign of Solomon, I would argue that all the borders that were discussed were fulfilled under Solomon and they brought tribute to him during his reign. But everybody doesn't like that one. 
In Joshua 21, verse 43 and 44, Joshua, remember Joshua who went into the land for the conquest? Joshua said, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. So at least in some sense, Israel enjoyed the promise that God had given to Abraham. They entered into the land, and at least from what I am seeing in Scripture, they, they held it, but they couldn't keep it. Why couldn't they keep it? Because of sin. So we still have a sin problem, right? So we're still moving toward God's redemption, yes? And there's a sin problem, and the sin problem, every once in a while gets Israel kicked out of the land. So you see it happen in Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, the Babylonian captivity, and afterwards, you could probably make an argument for Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, all to have had uh, authority over them and the land, leading all the way up to Christ. So, so we see the handwriting on the wall, right? But I would also say that the idea of the land, I think the Old Testament and the New Testament expand the idea. So I think there's more than just the boundaries of the Holy Land that we're talking about. When Jesus rules and reigns as king, he is not only king of Israel, he is king of yeah, the cosmos, right? I mean, all the way to Pluto. If there, I think somebody said there's not a Pluto anymore. Whatever, what, 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 however far it goes, he's the king of it all. So, so I'm going to just share a few scriptures, and I encourage you, go read these sections. The first one I'm going to start with is Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 11, very similar scriptures, oftentimes are applied to the millennial reign. But uh, Isaiah 65, it branches that a little broader. Isaiah 65 says, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered nor come into mind. So we have a tendency to think in small boundaries. And I think the progressive revelation of God begins with small boundaries but it expands not only to the whole earth, but to a new heaven and a new earth, to the new creation, right? Because what are we in Christ Jesus? We're new. The old has, and behold, all things have become new, right? So uh, Isaiah 66, 22, just write these down if you can. And if you want my notes, I'll be happy to give them to you. Uh, for as the new heavens and the new earth that I shall make remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. So the Lord is speaking to Israel, right, through the prophet Isaiah, and he's promising them new heaven and a new earth and their name. So it's not, that's not, it's not just, I just don't want us to only think in terms like um, we watch the news today and we're all thinking about the Palestinian uprising and the stuff going on in Israel and the things happening and there's all these people chanting from the river to the sea. And, and I, I think it should be from sea to shining sea because it's more than that. It's, I think it's bigger. I don't think it's just that. Isaiah eleven nine 9 says, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Uh, that's exactly the same way Isaiah 65 ends. So just take a look at those two together when you have a minute. Now, Jesus is going to quote from the Old Testament. That doesn't shock you guys because Jesus is the word of God. So whenever Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, I think we should pay attention. Jesus quotes in the Sermon on the Mount, from Psalm 37, 11. Psalm 37, 11 says, the meek shall inherit 
the land and delight themselves in an abundance of peace. Psalm 37 is a psalm about Israel's inheritance in the land, the land of Israel. Now, Jesus expands that in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't he? Because he says it how? The meek shall inherit what? The earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. And then Romans 4.13 says this, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world. So Paul, looking back at the Old Testament promise that we just read, he says of, of Abraham and his offspring, they're supposed to be heir of the world. So what I, and all I'm trying to say is as God's progressive revelation comes down through the covenants and the stories of the Old Testament to the new, it is sometimes expanded on because it's bigger than, what, than, than how he uh, originally lays it out to the people. Now, it's still a fulfillment if God gives them the world, isn't it? <clears throat> okay, so, so the idea that Paul's bringing out, Romans 4, 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring, they would be heir of the world, doesn't come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So how do, how do they find application to that promise? It's not just because of blood. They get application to the promise by faith. How are you a son of Abraham? It's not by blood, it's by faith. And so he's laying out this idea. Now, <clears throat> Don and I have talked a few times about Romans, or not Romans, sorry, Hebrews 11. So I'm gonna jump into Hebrews 11 for a minute. And, uh, and I just want to paint some of the picture. Hebrews 11 is a hall of faith. We're familiar, right, with the concept. Hebrews 11, 9 says, By faith he went to live in the land of promise, listen to this, as in a foreign land. He went to the land of promise that God said is yours. This is all yours. Far as you can see. But how did Abraham live there? He lived there like a foreigner. Because he's looking for what? A city and builder whose maker is the Lord, right? He's looking, there's more. There's more. Look what it says. He says, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same problem. Or, okay. What did I do with my water? If I ask nicely, bring it to me because I'm already out of time and I haven't got to the third one. Oh, Okay. I'd better. Oh. Oh, my gosh. All right. So let's just clarify. So everybody is aware. The six weeks experiment was over. I went to the doctor and my blood pressure six weeks off of Monster was worse than it was on Monster. But I have made the grown up decision to stay off them now since I've done six weeks. So, stop. So, I may treat myself occasionally, but, but, uh, but the, yeah, my blood pressure is worse. So, anyway, we have other, we have other things, we have other things we have to do. All right, let me get back to Hebrews 11, just a few more verses, and I'll, I'll do the next one next time. Uh, Hebrews 11. Verse 9, we talked about he's living as a foreigner, living in tents. Uh, go down to verse 13. And these all died in faith, not having received the things of promise. Now, my point is, Abraham was there in the land, but it didn't count as the fulfillment of the promise. Because it's more than just finding boundaries or the dirt under his feet. It's bigger than that. But having seen them, they saw the promises and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged their strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear they are seeking a homeland, a place where they belong. But Abraham, you are in the place of promise. But he's looking for a homeland, right? He says, I'm looking for a homeland. 
this is, this is cool, but I'm looking for a homeland. If they had only been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire, what's it say? A better country. And what's the next phrase? A heavenly one. See, it's more than just about the land. It's about, I think it's about new heaven and new earth. I think it's about the expanse. I think it's about being with God wherever God is. So if God is here in an earthly kingdom, then where do you want to be? Here in his kingdom, amen? And if, and if, we, if, if the Lord has come and that, that's over and he's established a new heaven and a new earth, where do we want to be? A new heaven and new earth. And when I look back, I'm not going to go, gosh, I missed the days of the millennial. No, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, damn, we're here, in the, we're here in the new heaven and the new earth. We're right where God wants us to be, right? And so this is, this is what I think Abraham, uh, uh, what the writer of Hebrews is, is pointing out, Abraham's thoughts. Um, they desired a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? For he has prepared them a city. And I would argue that city that the writer of Hebrews is talking about is spoken of in Revelation 21, 1 and 2. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city and new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So when I think about the promise of the, the number of people, right? I think that fulfillment, that expands through the New Testament. And I think the same thing about the land. The land expands. And I think there were hints in the Old Testament about that. But then also the authors of the New Testament expand, right? And say, it wasn't necessarily about the dirt Abraham was touching. It was about what he saw coming. It was about what he saw coming in Christ. And then uh, just the uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 21, 23, and then we'll, we'll, I'll do a quick recap uh, uh, next week and then we'll, go, we'll continue on. But it says, so let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Now, I do like to say, all means all, right? So, so, so we, 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 we can argue about the particulars, especially when it suits me. I really like that all things are all. So, so let no... No one boasts in men, for all things are yours. He's talking to the church in Corinth, right? He's saying, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all is yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. And my, my point is that that's, this is where I'm landing in is the idea that Christ is all in all. He's the focus and the fulfillment of those promises. Now we'll, like I said, we're going to develop some of that some more and don't, uh, don't get too excited because I'm not going to talk about eschatology, but I do want to talk about what I think Old Testament coming down into the new and the progressive revelation of God, uh, which is why I see things a little different now. All right. If you guys have questions or you want, um, cop my, right now my notes are like 15 pages. So, and it might be hard for you to understand what I got, but at least you'll have the references. You can go read up if you want. I'd be happy to give them to you. And uh, also all you guys, I think have my phone number. So feel free to call text just so you know, you won't be the only one. So don't take this personally, but you will be in a queue. And sometimes my queue moves slow. <laughs> move slower than it should but we, i will try to address all of those things you're also welcome to send me an email ask me questions on email we can do that as well whatever works uh me and don we're gonna get together and have a brisket so and talk about some of these things but um uh, i want i want you to be able to understand where how i see things and be able to at least understand when people say this or that about Jackie, what's real and what's not. And, and hopefully this will help us do that. All right? Let's pray. Okay. Well, so basically most of, most of the 
I don't know if I can think in the dark. <laughs> most, <laughs> most of the people that talk about this conflict that's going on now, they point to pre-1948. So Israel was in a land long before 1948, right? Israel, Israel can lay claim to that land way far back. Yeah, for sure. So, and I want you to know, after AD 70, when, when the temple was destroyed, there were still Jews in the land. They're not gone. They're still there. And they were there in 1948. But the nation that had control of the land in 1948 was Britain. Prior to Britain, you had the Ottomans. Prior to the Ottomans, uh, there's, another, there's another Muslim thing. I just lump them all together to Ottomans. Uh, then you have Rome, and then you have Greece, and then you have, you can go all the way back to Babylon. So, but they were there. And in 1948, Britain, who had control of the land, made a decision through the UN to give the land as a nation back to the Jews. Yeah, yeah. So, and all the people who were in there were given citizenship, whether they were Arab or Jew. So, and, and that was still, tr that was true until the divided, they'd, they surrendered the land to the Gaza. So the, the claims that most people make about, well, Israel doesn't belong here and they have no right to the land is just bogus, it's not real. But, you know, the idea about, you know, when we look at the nation of Israel, think about how many things God did with them that frustrated Satan. Right? Just the fact that they first off existed, he pulled them out of all those satanic kingdoms and then made one for himself. Then he revealed himself to them. Then he, he gave promises and then he sent Messiah who becomes the ultimate destruction for Satan. The idea that there's a satanic hatred for Israel is it's not hard to understand. So I think there's uh, certainly a measure of that. But you know, when people are arguing politics, haven't you learned that even in our own nation, nobody tells the truth? Every, all the stuff is basically, well, I'm gonna spin the story according to how it suits me. And that's just what they do. And so, and that's, the, you know, I don't, I don't anticipate, uh, any change, I think Israel retains control. I think Israel will be there in the land until Jesus comes back. But I, I can't prove that, but that's what I think. So, and, um, you know, I think, I think the whole time they're there, someone's going to be mad at them. So, but that's not new either. <laughs> that, that story kind of happens all the way through the Bible too. So. So we'll see some of those same things, but patterns. patterns, that's right. And types, and we'll talk about those. And hopefully I'll be able to get to Genesis in January. We'll see, but well, we will figure it out. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for this time. We can be gathered together. Uh, thank you for just the fulfillment of your promises, God. I thank you for how, how you're working. And I just pray, God, that, you know, it's, this is not about, um, uh, you know, thus saith the Lord. This is, this is a journey of understanding and comprehending with all the saints uh, what is the height and breadth and width and depth of the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, Lord, if there's questions and struggles, just help people as they read and study, open their eyes. Um, Lord, you are ultimately in control and you are able to course correct at any time. So Lord, we trust you in the things that you are doing and how you have moved, Lord, to accomplish your perfect purpose. But what we do pray for, Lord, is that there would be uh, an attitude of charity and uh, uprightness in how people share uh, the ideas and instead of hate and discontent, Lord, may you uh, just breathe love into the hearts of your people 
to be able to have the conversations uh, that they want to have. So we, all, we lay it all before you, God, and we give you all the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, why don't you guys stand up? Let's do, let's do Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.